Monday before the exam on Friday. Everybody's smiling at that? No. So I have scheduled a review session. Uh, the review, everybody got quiet then. Um, review session is scheduled for tomorrow night at 5 p.m. in ALS 4001. And like before, I will videotape it. And like before, I will get the videotape posted as quickly as I can. And if you have questions, uh, bring them there or come see me in my office. A lot of you have come to see me in my office. This class has been very good about that. And so I welcome having you come to my office. I know I've got a busy schedule. Uh, so you don't have to schedule a meeting with me. Just come to my office. I'll try to squeeze you in, I can assure you. Uh, and my aim is helping you. The TAs are also available, okay? So don't um, be afraid to take advantage of all those. And if you want a tutor or something like that, I can also help you to get that, although it might be a little tight getting it done before Friday, but we, can, we might even be able to do that if necessary. Okay, so that's announcement number one. Announcement number two is the exam will cover through the uh, repair. Okay, so you see DNA repair, it'll cover right through there. Recombination will be on the next exam. So if I cover through repair today, which is my intention, then that'll be the end of the material. But if, if I don't, then I'll finish the repair up on Wednesday and that'll be the material for the exam. Are we clear? So the material on the exam covers through DNA repair. And people ask me the question all the time, is the exam comprehensive? No, this exam is only since the last material but the final exam is comprehensive. And believe it or not, the final is rapidly approaching us as well. Oh boy, huh? <laughs> and then you're done with your biochemistry. Okay, well, I talked last time about the, I got started talking about the polymerase chain reaction and uh, I wanna make a few points about it again. So first of all, it's a method for amplifying DNA millions or billions of time, times. And that amplification can occur uh, in the span of a couple of hours, okay? You saw from what I described to you last time that each round or each cycle, which includes denaturation, primer annealing, and replication, that's a cycle, each cycle of that process occurring doubles the number of strands, at least theoretically. And that means if you take 2 to the 30th power, which is what you have when you do 30 cycles, if you do that on your calculator, you're going to see that's over a billion. Over a billion times as much at the end compared to what you start. The second thing that's very important to recognize is that the only sequences that get amplified are those between the primers. So you can specify this is the thing I want to amplify. So what the polymerase chain reaction does is it enables all of the advantages of DNA replication without doing it inside of a cell and that specificity that I talked about, amplifying only the DNA of interest. Okay? Why is that important? Well, the cellular, the, our genome has seven billion base pairs. If we think about a, uh, a sequence of a couple thousand base pairs, which is typically what we want to amplify, all right, that's a microscopic percentage of the entire thing. If we amplified everything, then our sequence that we're interested in would still be a very tiny percentage of all the DNA that's there. But if we amplify only the thing that we're interested in a billion fold, it becomes the most prominent thing that's in the replication mix. Now somebody asked me last time, how do you do this? And it turns out there are machines called PCR machines that do this, and they do it very readily. They have a very simple setup, okay? They have three temperatures that they run through, one corresponding to each cycle. One close to boiling to denature. One that allows the primers to find base pairs with their complementary sequence. And by the way, if there's magic in molecular biology, that's it. Those complementary sequences find each other, okay? And that happens ideally at a specific temperature called an annealing temperature. So we've got a boiling temperature, we've got annealing temperature, and third, we have a replication temperature, a temperature at which the DNA polymerase really likes to replicate DNA. So one cycle, 
a PCR includes those three temperature changes, and then it just repeats over and over and over for 30 cycles. Okay? I noted that the DNA polymerase that we use in PCR is one that comes from a bacterium that lives in the Old Faithful geyser, boiling temperatures. It's able to survive that, which means its proteins have to be able to survive that, which means its DNA polymerase has to be able to survive that. And that DNA polymerase is called TAC, T-A-Q, because the organism that it comes from is called Thermus aquaticus. No, you don't need to know that. But that's the name of the organism, and that's why the polymerase is called TAC DNA polymerase. And yes, there are other polymerases that are out there that come from other organisms that live in high temperature environments as well, but by far, TAC is the most common of all those. Okay, questions about PCR? I'm sure a fair percentage of you have done PCR work if you've worked in labs. Yes? So TAC is a DNA polymerase. It's called TAC DNA polymerase, and its job is to replicate the DNA from the point of the primer forwards. Yes, question over here. Do we need to know what those temperatures are? Those have I told them to you? Okay, so I haven't told you the temperatures, so no. And it varies with each reaction. So different primers will have different annealing temperatures, and that's not critical. But knowing that you need to have different temperatures is important, right? See, I limit, by, by not telling you things, I mean you don't have to know them, right? That's good. Other questions? Okay. Well, let's turn our attention now to uh, a little uh, variant, and that's thinking about replication of DNAs in eukaryotic cells. The overall scheme that we have, do you have a question? Sorry, I'm just curious. Yeah. Say it again. What was the temperature for, well, you didn't say it, but what is the temperature that? That the polymerase likes? So the question here is, what temperature does the polymerase like to replicate DNA at? Typically, it's about 70 degrees centigrade. But that's not something you should need to know. So, okay? Okay. Um, as I said, when thinking about DNA replication in eukaryotes versus, pro <coughs> versus prokaryotes, the general scheme is the same. <coughs> you have a helicase. You have a topoisomerase. You have a primase. Okay? The proteins have different names and different organizations, but the same basic scheme that I showed you for leading strand and lagging strand replication and all of the enzymes, that is all the activities, are the same. Okay? There are some differences, and that's what I want to focus on in terms of considerations for the two. The primary difference that we'll be concerned with is the fact that eukaryotic chromosomes are linear, not circular. Well, when we think about what I described with the prokaryotic chromosome, remember I said if we thought about the leading strand, we think about it, replicate, 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 and come all the way around, and it comes back around, and it finds the primer again. And it can remove the primer, and it's very easy to close the circle using the mechanisms I described. We don't have that luxury in eukaryotic systems, as we will see. So this table sort of summarizes the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic, noting some of the similarities and some of the differences. Okay, remember that prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, whereas eukaryotes have a nucleus. All right? The place where replication starts, I haven't given you that name, but I'm going to give it to you here. It's called an origin. Origin is a specific sequence in DNA that's recognized by the replication proteins specific sequence in DNA that's recognized by the replication proteins. In E. coli, that sequence has a name. It's called ORI-C, O-R-I, and then capital C. Okay? E. coli has one replication origin per the entire six million base pair circular DNA. Eukaryotic cells don't have that. They have many replication origins. And that's partly because eukaryotic chromosomes, excuse me, are very large. Some are 100, well over 100 million base pairs in length. I talked about how in E. coli replication can occur at 1,000 base pairs per second because it needs to. 
In eukaryotic cells, it doesn't occur nearly as fast because it doesn't need to. Fast replicating eukaryotic cells replicate once every 24 hours. Fast replicating E. coli cells replicate every 20 minutes. All right? So there's not as much of a rush. All right? Eukaryotic cells also are more complicated in the sense that eukaryotic cells have DNA coated with proteins. Prokaryotic cells don't have that. And so it's a more logistical, uh, logistically complicated system to replicate if we're replicating a eukaryotic cell. Okay? There's also two proteins in E. coli. I want you to know the names of them. They're called DNA A and DNA B. And these two proteins are the very first proteins that bind to the ORI C in E. coli. The very first proteins that bind. Okay? They actually have to open up the strands to get everything going. And they, the, the sequence that they open up, as I said, is called ORI C. And if we look at ORI C, we discover that ORI C is very rich in AT base pairs. And you remember that AT base pairs are weaker than GC. They only have two hydrogen bonds holding them together, meaning it's easier to open up ORI C because of that rich AT sequence. We'll see a similar thing happen when we talk about promoters in transcription starting on Wednesday. Okay. All right. Everything else you can see pretty much from that table. I'm not asking you to memorize the table, but there are some useful pieces of information there for you. Let's stop and think for a minute about the considerations for replicating linear chromosomes such as we have in eukaryotic cells. This figure takes you through the process, and you can see it starting at the end. Now, I want to emphasize that I'm making this simple. A normal eukaryotic cell will have replication occurring all the way, starting at all different places throughout here, because there's many origins per DNA. But I'm showing you the end for a reason, and I'm going to teach you something about the problems of replicating linear DNA molecules. Okay? Well, let's imagine. So here we start at the end. We've got a five prime uh, 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 to three prime strand. We've got a three prime to five prime strand. And you know that they replicate in different ways. Okay? So let's follow through replicating the three prime to five prime strand first. That would mean we have the leading strand because the complementary strand is going to be five prime to three prime to it. <clears throat> Once we get started, we can imagine that this goes all the way through to the end, although realistically it's a little bit more complicated than that. But in simple terms, that's what's happening. There's our leading strand, shown in blue. There's the lagging strand, shown in purple, and it occurs in pieces, just like we saw in E. coli. There's a problem. The problem is this. All DNA replication starts with a primer. And all DNA replication in cells starts with an RNA primer. That RNA primer comes from action of an enzyme called primase, of course. That is an RNA polymerase. I've marked the primers by black boxes. You can see the black boxes. And you know that cells have a primer removing activity, like we saw in DNA polymerase 1, that removed the primers. And we can see the primers being removed. When we remove the primer at the five prime end, there's no way to replace it. There's no way to replace it because the DNA polymerase can't come in and start filling in that gap. And as a consequence of that, when we look down here, we see where the five prime end was on that blue strand. What do we see? We see a gap. What that means is that every time a linear DNA replicates, a little bit of DNA is lost. So that when this blue strand is replicated, it only goes to the end of the blue. It doesn't get that little sequence that was there. If the cell didn't have a way of compensating for that, you would run into deep doo-doo pretty quickly. So the first thing that comes to your mind is, if I look at an old cell and I compare it to a young cell, will the length of the chromosomes be different? And the answer is, yes, they will. Older cells will have shorter chromosomes than will younger cells. My cells are going to have shorter chromosomes than yours. 
It's not the way I want to lose weight. Because DNA is inf can, carries information. And the shorter those DNAs get, the more likely I am to lose critical information. Because information is encoded in genes, and genes code for proteins, and proteins are necessary for my cells to be alive. So if I lose a sequence that's a critical protein, what's going to happen to that cell? Very good. You like the same gesture I did. Okay? It's dead. Okay? Well, fortunately, we have what I call a buffer, or you might even think of it as a fuse, okay, that protects us. That buffer or fuse is a bunch of not random, but repeated sequences at the end called a telomere. Telomere is what people used to refer to as part of junk DNA. They called it junk DNA because anything that didn't code for protein, they considered junk. And eukaryotic cells are full of junk in that sense. They've got repeated sequences at the end that are repeated thousands of times. They've got repeated sequences in the middle. They've got all kinds of other sequences in the middle that don't code for protein. And now we're learning a lot about what all those sequences do. But it's the ones at the end that we're going to focus on right now. The telomere, T-E-L-O-M-E-R-E. -E. A telomere is a, is a buffer protecting the critical sequences in the middle of the chromosome from the sequences at the end that are lost in each round of DNA replication. Okay? Do the lengths of your telomeres determine how long you will live? It's a question people have asked. And there may be, it's not completely clear, there may be a relationship between that. Okay, we're still investigating that. But it's not an unreasonable question. Okay? Well, how do the telomeres get there? All I've talked about is how they disappear. How in the world do they get there? You're going to like this part. They get there as part of an enzyme action called telomerase. A's referring to enzyme, telomer referring to the telomere. So a telomerase is something that makes telomeres. That's the good news. There's also bad news. Okay? This microscopic image of chromosomes okay, has used antibodies to label the telomeric sequences in the chromosomes. And you can see that in every case, the telomeric sequences are located at the end. Okay? Those telomeric sequences are the things that I'm referring to. What does telomerase do? Well, first of all, let me tell you where we find it before I tell you what it does or how it does it. You might think, well, then it's a trivial thing. Our telomeres shouldn't be getting shorter because once they get short, then they just get replaced. And that doesn't happen. Telomerase is primarily active in embryonic cells. Your telomeric lengths get set very early. Okay? Telomerase is also active in stem cells. Okay? Because they've got to be able to reproduce all these various things. And so you might think, most common question I get, you might think that well, if I could just make telomerase active in all my cells, I will live forever. There's the fountain of youth. Because if I make telomerase active, I will live forever. And it's a great idea, and it's a terrible idea, because I haven't told you the third type of cells that telomerase is active in, and that's cancer cells. By activating telomerase in all cells, we may be favoring Okay? Process is occurring that we really don't want favoring. In fact, instead of activating telomerase, one of the strategies people have now for fighting cancer is to put telomerase inhibitors in cancer cells 
Because if you knock out the ability of telomerase in a cancer cell to elongate that telomere, what's going to happen when that cancer cell starts rapidly dividing? It'll kill itself. Because it'll shorten its telomeres so much that it'll start eating away those critical genes that it needs to stay alive and die. And there are drugs on the market that people are trying that for some types of cancer appear that they may be beneficial to inhibit the telomerase. So telomerase is a pretty fascinating enzyme. It's appropriate then for us to think about and understand how that enzyme works. Telomerase works by binding to the end of a linear chromosome. If we think about the end, we have a five prime end and we have a three prime end. Replication will have to occur from the three prime end because replication only occurs five prime to three prime. But how does telomerase work? I could see how it could add sequences onto a three prime end, but it has nothing to copy. The five prime end isn't out here for it to copy. What does it have to copy? It's got to copy something, and this is a very cool trick that's unique to telomerase. All DNA polymerases copy something, including telomerase. They don't just randomly put sequences at the end. Telomerase copies a short nucleotide sequence, depends on the organism, of about seven to 10 base pairs. And it copies it over and over and over and over. That's why there's so many thousands of repeats of that sequence at the end of a chromosome. Where does that sequence come from? Telomerase carries it with it. Telomerase is the only DNA polymerase that carries its own complementary strand. It carries its own complementary strand. And here's another hook. The complementary strand that it carries is not DNA. The complementary strand that it carries is a short sequence of RNA. A short sequence of RNA. Which means that telomerase is using RNA as the complementary nucleic acid. You haven't seen that yet. We've had RNA primers, but RNA primers are different than what's being copied, right? There are enzymes that are known that are DNA polymerases that copy RNA. We know them from viruses. For example, HIV virus has a DNA polymerase I've mentioned already called reverse transcriptase. And it gets its name by virtue of the fact that reverse transcriptases copy RNA and make DNA from them. Telomerase is doing just that. It's copying an RNA that it carries and makes DNA from it. Telomerase is a type of reverse transcriptase. Yes, Rania. It is an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. That's a very good question. So RNA-dependent DNA polymerase means it copies RNA and makes DNA from it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, different, uh, so good question. Are there different telomerases that have different 7 to 10, 10 base pairs on it? Within a given organism, no, but between organisms, yes. Good. Now, notice that it's essentially leading strand synthesis that's occurring here. Because we've described, described to you how we're replicating that top strand. I haven't talked about how we replicate the bottom strand. We've got a long sequence that goes out here on the top strand, replicated, replicated, replicated. For replication, the bottom strand to occur, it's got to go backwards. And that's going to be the equivalent of lagging strand replication. An RNA primer comes in, DNA gets filled in. RNA primer, DNA gets filled in. RNA primer, DNA gets filled in. That's how the bottom strand gets replicated. So as a result of action, of telomerase and lagging strand synthesis, a chromosome gets lengthened. Very important. If we don't lengthen the chromosome, 
the kids that we have aren't going to live very long. Right? Their lifetime is going to be set by how long our telomeres were when we created the sperm and the egg that fertilized them. Right? Questions about that? Yes? Are there any diseases where someone doesn't have telomerase? As far as I know, no, but I'm not an expert in that field. You would predict probably they'd have some pretty significant problems because stem cells need to have a telomerase active to keep the ends of a sufficient length uh, to grow, but I don't know the answer to your question. Yes? Is there some sort of regulation for telomerase in embryonic cells? Is there a regulation for, stem, uh, for telomerase in embryonic cells, meaning a limit in how, how long it'll go? Um, as far as I know, there's not a limit. There, you, would, you would guess there very likely might be. I should mention one uh, related answer to your question, and that is that, well, why don't we have telomerase in all of our cells? And the answer to that is it's not being made. It's not being transcribed and translated in the rest of our cells. Yes? Say it again. So the telomerase is binding to the, the, the three prime end. It's doing the equivalent of what I would call leading strand replication, okay? Because it's not going backwards as such. It's the backwards lagging strand replication, uh, replication backwards that's like the lagging strand. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question though. Well, there's no primer for this strand on the top. The primer is actually the end of the DNA itself, the three prime end. That's the primer. Okay. All right, if you have questions about that, please come see me. I'll be happy to uh, step you through it. Uh, pretty fascinating process. If you want more detail, you can look at that, and it'll show you uh, more about what I've just told you in words. Okay, well, that finishes what I want to say about DNA replication in general. I want to turn our attention now to talking about repairing damage to DNA. We see the importance cells have of maintaining the integrity of the genome. That's why they have evolved polymerases and, and um, proofreading systems that are as accurate as they are because maintaining that integrity is critical. If we want progeny cells to have traits like the parents, then they should have a pretty close approximation of that DNA sequence that made it. One of the systems, as I noted, is proofreading and that helps to ensure accuracy. There are other circumstances that cells may encounter that can give rise to problems and this and, and these problems must be fixed, ideally, for some cell, because otherwise the cell um, is in deep doo-doo. And we see in a multicellular organism like us that if problems aren't fixed and the, re and the um, DNA is favored for mutation, the more mutation you favor, the more likely you will be to have formation of a cancer. So repair systems are very critical for multicellular organisms. We find them in both multicellular and single cellular organisms. But for a multicellular organism, if we don't fix those problems, we got some potentially big problems. Well, the first of those I want to talk about is what's called nucleotide excision repair. There are three types of repair systems I'm going to describe to you. Nucleotide excision repair is a repair system that is aimed at fixing big, bulky changes in a double helix. I've shown one of those right here, okay? This is uh, an example of something that is a molecule that is not a part of a DNA, but it might be something that uh, arises from the environment. Smoking, for example, creates big, bulky DNA adducts that can react with bases of DNA in a mechanism like what we've seen here, and actually insert itself into the DNA double helix. Okay? If we had that circumstance, the DNA would literally bulge at that point. Well, that bulge is a signal 
to the DNA repair systems that Houston, we've got a problem. This bulge, this whatever it is that's in our DNA has got to be fixed. Maybe we can remove it. Maybe we can repair it. And if we can't do either one of those, then ideally the cell is given a signal that it must commit suicide. Because again, we don't want uncontrolled growth. Well, so the nucleotide excision repair system is important for bulky adducts, as I noted. Okay? We can schematically see this bulge being recognized right here, and we see it recognized with something, in this case, I've called a thymine dimer. And you may have heard of thymine dimers. Thymine dimers are not adducts, but they're actually bulges that arise from two thymines within a DNA strand reacting with each other. That will also create a bulge. Thymine dimers, the most common way you get thymine dimers is by going to a tanning booth. Anybody who goes to a tanning booth ought to have their head examined. Literally. Okay? If you want to favor skin cancer, that is numero uno on the way to do it. Numero uno. Because the primary way you get thymine dimers is from ultraviolet radiation hitting your DNA. And when that happens, two thymines will covalently bond with each other, as you can see here. Now, well, so what? I got a repair system, right? Well, yeah. How many of you had an old junker of a car? And you've taken it to the repair shop many times, and you continue to have problems. Are you going to take that car on a long road trip to Alaska? Probably you're going to be a little nervous, right? The more you do repair, okay, the more likely you're going to miss something that needs repairing. And that's true of your DNA repair systems as well. So even though you have these DNA repair systems, the more you challenge them, the more likely something is going to slip through that is going to be problematic for you. Okay? So what I'm going to tell you is how this is going to bail your butt out. Okay? But it's not going to work every time. It's like smoking a cigarette. The way you get those DNA addicts is by smoking, one, one of those ways is by smoking cigarettes. And the more cigarettes you smoke, the more DNA addicts you get, and the more likely you are going to have some that are going to slip through. Tanning booths are no different than smoking cigarettes. No different. Okay? If I convince one person in here to quit going to tanning booths, I'll be happy. Just like if I convinced anybody to quit smoking, I would be happy. Because they're the same stupid thing. Okay, enough said about stupid. How do they work? Well, they're proteins that recognize, recognize that bulge. Okay? And in this case of a, thymine, uh, of a thymine dimer, there's an enzyme called a photolyase that will actually, this is amazing, use light to fix the problem. Light caused the problem. Light, in the case of a photolyase, uh, light caused the problem, light can fix the problem with the presence of a photolyase. It's a pretty remarkable thing. There are other nucleotide excision proteins that will cut out, that's why it's called nucleotide excision, they'll cut out a short stretch of DNA around there and then allow the DNA polymerase to fill it in. So nucleotide excision repair is important for bulges, those bulges can arise from adducts or from thymine dimers. So what a thymine dimer looks like. Notice that the thymines that are being joined are on the same strand. See it right here. They're on the same strand. It's not across the duplex, but within the same strand. And it happens when two thymines are next to each other and they get exposed to sufficiently strong ultraviolet light. Okay. There's another view of the same thing. And repair systems. So I mentioned that adducts, things besides thymine dimers, can be removed by exonucleases. And no, I'm not going to ask you to know all those names. But understand the general system. Removal of a stretch that contains that adduct. And then repair by the DNA repair system, by the DNA polymerase system. 
Sorry, question? Yeah. There are two ways to repair the thymine dimers. That's correct. So I use the second one as an example of an adduct, but in fact, it's actually two thymines. But if I had a large molecule that had gotten joined, exactly that same thing as I showed you on that last mechanism would occur. Okay, so that's nucleotide excision repair. Base excision repair is another mechanism that cells have. And this one's interesting. They're all interesting. This one's interesting for a different reason, though. And it arises because of the natural chemistry of the bases within DNA. It turns out cytosine is chemically slightly unstable. And by the slightly, we're talking about long term, many years. But nonetheless, over many years, what can happen is cytosine can do what we call deaminate, meaning it loses its amine up here on the top and be replaced by an oxygen. If that happens, cytosine is converted to uracil. What does uracil pair with? A. What did cytosine pair with? G. If that is not fixed, when that DNA goes to replicate, you've now put a, an incorrect base in there. Again, potentially leading to cancer. Well, it turns out that we know that U doesn't belong in DNA, right? That's why the cell keeps you out of DNA, because of this reaction. Because it knows whenever it sees you in DNA, it knows that this has happened. And so it has a system to go through and look for U's in DNA. And when it sees them, it says, oh, the U is the mutation. Let's get rid of it. This is called base excision. Because it actually, the first thing that happens is the removal of the U. And it's kind of a cool system for doing that. Let me show you what it looks like here. Here's a double helix. You can see the double helix in blue and in red. And you can see where the uracil was in yellow. Notice all the other bases are on the inside of the double helix. The U was originally inside of the double helix as well. But this repair protein saw the U and it flipped it out of the double helix, allowing the U to be clipped off. So in base excision repair, the first thing that happens is that the incorrect base is removed. And we see the first step of that happening right here with the flipping out of the U, and then it gets chopped. There's an enzyme called uracil DNA, glyco uracil N glycosylase that does the clipping. There's that flipped out base, and it gets cut off. We're not going to worry about the mechanism. But you can see it's been flipped out just like it was in that last image. So base excision repair most commonly involves use and removal of use by uracil and glycosylase. The last uh, mechanism I want to talk about with respect to repair. By the way, questions? I'm, I'm going through a little fast. I know that. Question over here. Uh, so if the U actually gets replicated, yep. um, Good question. So if U gets replicated, the other strand gets an A, does the cell have a mechanism for handling the A? The answer is no. The answer is no. What helps to cue the cell is the fact that that U, remember that it was a C that mutated, that U is paired with G before the repair. So that makes a slight bulge, and that slight bulge is an indication that here's where the problem is. If replication occurs so that U comes across from an A, the cell doesn't have a bulge because U and A pair very well, and it doesn't know this is the place to remove something. It's a very good question. But once it's replicated, then it's pretty much there. OK? Yes? So after the uracil is excised, does something have to then go back in? Very good question. So after the uracil is excised, does something else have to go in? And the answer is yes. I didn't tell you that. Thank you for reminding me to, to say that. 
The same thing that happened in the bulge repair, in the nucleotide excision repair, happens. That is, a section is removed and DNA polymerase comes in and fills it in. So that mechanism of removing a section where the damage occurs, okay, is a very critical step in the, in the repair systems. And in fact, it's true for all of the repair systems I'm going to tell you. Okay? Other questions? Okay, the last repair system I want to talk about is mismatch repair. And you've already seen something like it. Proofreading was a way of checking if you had a mismatch. But I told you that proofreading doesn't fix every problem. Just like you don't see every error in what you type, the proofreader of DNA polymerase doesn't see every error that it makes. So some errors make it into the DNA past the proofreading. And even though they're very infrequent, okay, it's useful for the cell to have a mechanism to remove them. So we can imagine that replication has proceeded here and instead of putting a C across from G, the cell put a T in across from G. What's it going to see? It's going to see a bulge. We see bulges to all three. The biggest bulges we see are in the first one. Nucleotide excision repair has the biggest bulges. We see tiny bulges for mismatches. Like we have a U across from a G, or in this case, if we have a T across from a G. We see minor bulges that happen. Okay? In this case, the cell's got a little bit of a problem. When there's U on a strand, the cell knows that the problem is with the U. When the cell has a GT, it doesn't know was the T the one that was done wrong, or was it the G that was one that was done wrong? How does it tell? Well, we don't completely know, but in the case of E. coli, we know fairly well how this happens. It happens as a result of action of a, um, uh, what's called a, a DNA methylase system that I want to show you. So first of all, let me just show you the mechanism, then I'll show you how it recognizes which is the bad strand. Okay, so we see the bulge, what do we see? We see removal of a stretch, we see replication to repair, and we see the whole thing is taken care of. In this case, it said that the problem was with the T. But how did it know it was with the T? That's where the DNA methylase system comes into play. It has to be able to identify where the st which strand had the problem. In E. coli, all occurrences of the sequence GATC are targets of an enzyme called a methylase that puts a methyl group on A's. So if we have a double-stranded DNA, methylase comes along, puts methyls on there, and we see A's on each strand that have that. If DNA replication occurs, DNA replication occurs before the methylase. So when replication occurs, we see something called hemimethylated, meaning one strand is methylated, but in each case here, the red strand is the new strand. The DNA, the A in the DNA doesn't have a methyl group on it. The methylase comes on later. So there's a short period of time where the repair system can look and say, oh, there's a bulge, right? There's a bulge, and all I have to do is decide which strand has a methylated A close. It doesn't have to be, a meth you know, it doesn't have to be within a GATC sequence. It could be further away. But if th this strand that I'm in has a GAT sequence 100 bases away, then this strand is the old strand. The GAT sequence ha has no methyl on the A here. This strand over here where the, mutation, wh where the different sequences must be the new and mutant strand. So the GAT se sequence tells the cell it tells the repair system which strand is the new one wherever the mutation occurs. So if the mutation is out here, okay, it knows that the blue strand was the old strand. That's not the problem. The red strand is the problem. And it usually creates a few questions. Everybody's kind of digesting that one. Yes, sir? Is it recognizing that sequence or binding directly to it? Both. That's how it recognizes it, is by binding to it. 
So the repair system has to first go looking for GATC sequences. Right? Once it finds those, it knows where the new versus old is. Yes? So the question is, what if the bulge occurs over here and there's no GATC sequence? It looks for the closest one. That's why I say it. it depends on how close it is. On average, GATC, if you look at randomness, will occur once every 256 bases. So it's usually not very far away that you'll have a GATC sequence. Other questions about that? Yes? Yes? Yep. Very good question. What happens if the methylase gets in there first, then what does the cell do? Then it's 50-50. Meaning that it can't tell. So it needs to have that repair system work before the methylase goes in and does its thing. Right. Yes? Will it still fix one and try to, try to fix? As far as I know, yes. Okay? Which means that it, it's no better than random when it's a 50 50. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so if we have bacteria that exchange DNAs, all right. Will all bacteria have a GATC uh, system? Is that, is that the question? Are they going to transfer this methylation to the new bacteria? So the methylation is covalently attached to the DNA. So yes, that would happen. But I think the bigger question is, do all bacteria use a GATC system? And we don't know that. We know it definitely occurs in E. coli and probably occurs in most bacteria, but we don't know that it occurs everywhere. All right, that's the end of the material for this exam. I've got a song to help you with studying. Oh. All right, and it's called Things You Should Remember. Things you should remember. I want to hear you. Ding. For this exam, all the pathways since September and the molecules comprising them, though that is an awful lot of information, I hope that you can retain it all. If you do, you will avoid a great deflation. When you study right, you will recall. All your preparation, there is something you should regard. How your brain stores information. So transcribe your notes onto a card. I assure you it will up your recollection of enzymes in complex Hayworth rings. It will drive performance to perfection simply from the act of writing things. Yes, sure you will up your recollection of enzymes and complex Hayworth rings. It will drive performance to perfection simply from the act of writing things. So go forward now and write down things. By the way, uh, this does not mean you get a note card for the exam. You will get a note card for the final exam, but 
I believe strongly in the value of writing things down in the learning process, okay? So write things down, but you won't get to use a note card here. Okay, see you guys at the review session tomorrow night at 5 in ALS 4001.